Hello everyone! Welcome to another edition of Lunchtime Storytime. Today I will be reading Stone Soup by Marsha Brown. Uh, this book was initially published, I think, in the early 1960s? Let's see. 1947, my goodness. So this book is a version of an old folk tale. But it has beautiful illustrations, so I will be reading this for you today, and then we will uh, jump in with some more Paddington Bear adventures. So, let me get my hydration in my Abraham Lincoln cup. It's important to drink plenty of water, and quarantine and always, but especially when you're not doing anything else but staying healthy. So, stone soup. An old tale, told and pictured by Marcia Brown. Three soldiers trudged down a road in a strange country. They were on their way home from the wars. Besides being tired, they were hungry. In fact, they had eaten nothing for two days. How I would like a good dinner tonight, said the first, and a bed to sleep in, said the second. But all that is impossible, said the third. We must march on. On they marched. Suddenly, ahead of them, they saw lights of a village. Maybe we'll find a bite to eat here, said the first, and a loft to sleep in, said the second. No harm in asking, said the third. Now the peasants of that place feared strangers. When they heard that their soldiers were coming down the road, they talked amongst themselves. Here come the soldiers. Soldiers are always hungry, but we have little enough for ourselves. And they are... And they hurried to hide their food. I can't always read upside down. <laughs> they pushed sacks of barley under the hay in the lofts. They lowered buckets of milk down the wells. They spread quilts over carrot bins. They hid their cabbages and potatoes under the beds. They hung their meat in cellars. They hid all they had to eat. Then they waited. The soldiers stopped first at the house of Paul and Francois. Good evening to you, they said. Could you spare a bit of food for three hungry soldiers? We have had no food ourselves for three days, said Paul. Francois made a sad face. It has been a poor harvest. The three soldiers went on to the house of Albert and Louise. Could you spare a bit of food? And have you some corner where we could sleep for the night? Oh no, said Albert. We gave all we could spare to the soldiers who came before you. Our beds are full, said Louise. At Vincent and Marie's house, the answer was the same. It had been a poor harvest, and all the grain must be kept for seed. So it went all through the village. Not a peasant had any food to give away. They all had good reasons. One family had used the grain for feed. Another had an old sick father to care for. All had too many mouths to fill. The villagers stood in the street and sighed. They looked as hungry as they could. The three soldiers talked together. So here are the peasants looking very, very hungry indeed. Then the first soldier called out, Good people! The peasants drew near. We are three hungry soldiers in a strange land. We have asked you for food, and you have no food. Well then... We'll have to make stone soup. The peasants stared. Stone soup? That would be something to know about. First, we'll need a large iron pot, the soldiers said. The peasants brought the largest pot they could find. How else to cook enough? That's none too large, said the soldier. But it will do. And now, water to fill it and a fire to heat it. It took many buckets of water to fill the pot. A fire was built on the village square, and soon the pot was set to boil. 
And now, if you please, three round, smooth stones. Those were easy enough to find. The peasants' eyes grew round as they watched the soldiers drop the stones into the pot. Any soup needs salt and pepper, said the soldiers, as they began to stir. Children ran to fetch salt and pepper. Stones like these generally make good soup. But oh, if there were carrots, it would be so much better. Why, I think I have a carrot or two, said Francoise, and off she ran. She came back with her apron full of carrots from the bins beneath the quilt. A good stone soup should have cabbage, the soldier said as they sliced the carrots into the pot. But no use asking for what you don't have. Hmm, I think I could find a cabbage somewhere, said Marie, and she hurried home. Back she came with three cabbages from the cupboard under the bed. If we only had a bit of beef and a few potatoes, this soup would be good enough for a rich man's table. Mm, the peasants thought that over. They remembered the potatoes and the sides of beef hanging in the cellars. They ran to fetch them. A rich man's soup, and all from a few stones. It seemed like magic. So here are all the villagers bringing their supplies. Ah, said the soldiers as they stirred in the beef and potatoes. If we only had a little barley and a cup of milk, this soup would be fit for a king himself. Indeed, he asked us for just such a soup when we dined with us. The peasants looked at each other. The soldiers had entertained the king? Well, but no use asking for what you don't have, the soldiers sighed. The peasants brought their barley from the lofts. They brought their milk from the well. The soldiers stirred the barley and milk into the steaming broth with the peasants, uh, while the peasants stared. Here they are, stirring. At last, the soup was ready. All of you shall taste, the soldier said, but first a table must be set. Great tables were placed in the village square. All around were lighted torches. Such a soup! How good it smelled! Truly fit for a king! But then the peasants asked themselves, would not such a soup require bread and a roast and cider? Soon a banquet was spread and everyone sat down to eat. Never had there been such a feast. Never had the peasants tasted such soup. And fancy, all made from stones. They ate and drank and ate and drank. After that, they danced. They danced and sang far into the night. At last they were tired. Then the three soldiers asked, Is there not a loft where we could sleep? Let three such wise and splendid gentlemen sleep in a loft? Indeed, they must have the best beds in the village. So the first soldier slept in the priest's house. And the second soldier slept in the baker's house. And the third soldier slept in the mayor's house. In the morning, the whole village gathered in the square to give them a send-off. Many thanks for what you have taught us, the peasants said to the soldiers. We shall never go hungry now that we know how to make soup from stones. Oh, it's all in the knowing how, said the soldiers. And off they went down the road. And here are the villagers thinking, such men don't grow on every bush. And that is stone soup. So I like this story because it's all about the virtues of sharing and community. And those things are very important. And now I think we have time for a chapter of Paddington Bear. The last time we left Paddington, he had just done a spot of decorating and had wallpapered himself into his room so badly that he couldn't even find the door. And this chapter is called Paddington Makes a Clean Sweep.
Paddington stood in the middle of the Brown's dining room and gazed with interest. When Mrs. Bird had brought him his breakfast in bed that morning, he'd had his suspicions that something unusual was going on. Breakfast in bed on a weekday was a sure sign that Mrs. Bird wanted him out of the way. But not even the distant bumping noises, which had been going on from quite an early hour, had in any way prepared him for the sight which now met his eyes. Normally, the Browns' house was tidier than most, but on this particular morning the dining room looked very much as if a hurricane had recently passed through. The furniture had all been moved to one end. The carpet had been rolled up and was standing against one of the walls. There were no curtains at any of the windows, and the pictures had all been taken down. Even the grate was cold and empty, and the only heat came from an electric fire at one end of the room. "'I didn't know you were cleaning your springs, Mrs. Bird,' he exclaimed, looking most surprised. "'Doggies! Doggies! It is just our neighbors!' "'Hello, neighbors!' "'Not cleaning our springs,' repeated Mrs. Bird. "'Spring cleaning! That's quite a different matter!' "'It means cleaning the whole house from top to bottom,' explained Mrs. Brown. "'It'll be your room next. We can't leave it a moment longer.' "'And talking of not leaving things a moment longer,' said Mrs. Bird, as she hurried out of the room, "'if we don't get a move on and buy that curtain material, we shan't have any dinner tonight.' "'Do you think we ought to take him with us?' asked Mrs. Brown, as she followed Mrs. Bird into the hall, leaving Paddington to investigate the unusual state of affairs in the dining room by himself. "'He's got a very good eye for a bargain.' "'No,' said Mrs. Bird firmly. "'Definitely not.' It's bad enough shopping when the spring sales are on at the best of times, but if that bear comes with us, there's no knowing what we shall end up with. Bargain or no bargain, he can stay home and mind the house. Mrs. Brown cast a doubtful look after her housekeeper as she disappeared up the stairs. Although from past experience she agreed with Mrs. Bird on the subject of Paddington accompanying them on shopping expeditions, the thought of him being left in charge of the house while they were in the middle of spring cleaning raised even more serious doubts in her mind. "'I can see it's going to be one of those days,' she called as the sound of hammering came from somewhere overhead. "'What with the chimney and spring cleaning into the bargain, anything can happen.' "'And probably will,' said Mrs. Bird, as she came back down the stairs, adjusting her hat. "'But worrying it about it won't alter things. Where's that bear? I haven't given him his instructions yet.' "'Here I am, Mrs. Bird,' called Paddington, hurrying into the hall. Mrs. Bird looked at him suspiciously. There was a gleam in his eyes which she didn't like the look of at all, but fortunately for Paddington, she was in too much of a hurry to look deeply into the matter. "'I've left you some salad on a tray,' she said, "'and there's a stew ready on the stove. Only mind you don't singe your whiskers when you light the gas, and don't let it boil dry. I don't want to find any nasty smells when I get home.' "'Thank you very much, Mrs. Bird,' said Paddington. "'Perhaps I could do some tidying up while you're out,' he added hopefully, as he's followed the others toward the front door. I've never done any spring cleaning before. Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird exchanged glances. You may do some dusting if you like, said Mrs. Brown, but I shouldn't do too much tidying up. It's all rather heavy, and you might strain yourself. I'm afraid we shall have to eat in the kitchen for a day or two, at least until Mr. Brown is to clean the chimney. Though goodness knows when that will be. Mrs. Brown gave Paddington one last look as she hurried after Mrs. Bird. "'I do hope she'll be all right,' she said. "'Willing paws make light work,' replied Mrs. Bird. "'And if it keeps him out of mischief, there won't be any great harm done.' Mrs. Brown gave a sigh, but luckily for her peace of mind, every step down Windsor Gardens took her further and further away from number 32, for if she had been able to see inside her house at that moment, she might have felt even less happy about leaving Paddington to his own devices. After he closed the front door, Paddington hurried back down the hall with an excited gleam in his eyes. There was an idea stirring in the back of his mind to do with a large, interesting-looking box with a Barkridge's label tied to the outside, which he had seen standing by the dining-room fireplace. For some days, the word chimney had cropped up a number of times in the Brown household. It had all started when Mrs. Bird opened the dining-room door one morning and found the room full of smoke. Shortly afterwards, Mr. Brown spent some time on the telephone, only to announce that all the local chimney sweeps had so much work on their hands that they were booked up for weeks to come. At the time, Paddington hadn't given the matter much thought. It seemed rather a lot of fuss to make over a little bit of smoke, and after peering up the chimney once or twice, he had decided that there wasn't much to see anyway. Even Mr. Brown, when Mr. Brown dropped a chance remark at breakfast one morning about doing it himself, he hadn't paid a great deal of attention.' 
but the news that operations were about to commence, together with the arrival of the mysterious-looking box, had aroused his interest at last. The outside of the box exceeded his wildest dreams. Even the label was exciting. It was made up of a number of brightly colored pictures called Easy Stages, and all across the top, in large capital letters, were the words Sweep It Clean, the all-British Do-It-Yourself Chimney Sweep Outfit. Underneath, in smaller print, the label went on to say that even a child of ten could make the dirtiest chimney spotless in a matter of moments. To show how easy it was, the first picture had a small boy fitting the various bits and pieces together as he prepared to sweep his father's chimney. Paddington felt a slight pang of guilt as he lifted the lid of the box and peered inside, but he soon lost it as he settled down in an armchair, dipping his paw into a jar of marmalade every now and then as he examined the contents. Although none of the pictures on the label mentioned anything about bears being able to sweep their chimneys, it made everything look so clear and simple that he began to wonder why anyone ever bothered to hire a real chimney sweep at all. One picture even showed a large ba bag labeled Soot standing next to a pile of silver coins and followed it with the inscription, Make money in your spare time by selling soot to your neighbors for their garden. Paddington couldn't quite picture Mr. Curry actually paying for someone else's suit, but all the same, he began to feel that Mr. Brown's outfit was very good value indeed. Inside the box, there was a large round brush, together with a number of long rods with metal ends that screwed together to form one long pole. Underneath the rods was yet another compartment containing a sack for the suit and a sheet with two armholes so that the person sweeping the chimney could fix it to the mantelpiece and work without getting the rest of the room dirty. Paddington tried putting his paws through the sheet, and after screwing the brush onto the one of the rods, he spent several enjoyable minutes while he hurried around the room, poking it into various nooks and crannies. And here he is, poking the brush. It was when he decided to test it up the chimney itself that a thoughtful expression gradually came over his face. The brush went up and down remarkably easily, and even with only one rod, the grate was full of suit in no time at all. Paddington grew more and more thoughtful as he shoveled the soot into the sack, and then tried fixing a second rod to the first. Although Mrs. Brown hadn't actually mentioned anything about sweeping the chimney, he felt sure it could quite easily come under the heading of dusting. Number 32, Windsor Gardens, was a tall house, and as the bundle of rods by Paddington's side got smaller and smaller, so the pile of soot in the grate grew larger and deeper. Several times he had to stop and clear it away to make room for his paws, as first the sack, and then several of Mrs. Bird's old grocery boxes became full to the brim. He was beginning to give up hope of ever reaching the top, when suddenly, without any warning, the brush freed itself, and he nearly fell over into the grate as he clung to the last of the rods. Paddington sat in the fireplace for a while, mopping his brow with a corner of the sheet, and then, after disappearing upstairs for a few moments, he hurried outside, carrying his binoculars. According to a note on the box lid, the exciting part about sweeping a chimney was always the moment when the brush popped out of the chimney pot, and he was particularly anxious to see this for himself. Carefully adjusting the glasses, he climbed the ladder which Mr. Briggs, the builder, had left standing against the side of the house, and peered up at the roof with a pleased expression on his face. The view through the binoculars of the brush poking out of Mr. Brown's chimney pot almost exactly matched the picture on the box. Paddington spent some time drinking in the view, and then he climbed back down the ladder and hurried into the house, wearing the air of a bear with a job well done. All in all, it had been a good morning's work, and he felt sure the Browns would be very pleased when they reached home and found how busy he'd been. Pulling the brush back down the chimney proved to be a lot easier than pushing it up had been, and it seemed only a matter of moments before he found himself reaching up behind the sheet for the last of the rods. It was as he disentangled himself from the sheet that a startled expression suddenly came over Paddington's face, and he nearly fell over backwards with surprise as he stared at the rod in his paw. He rubbed his eyes in case he'd got some suit in them by mistake, and then gazed at the end of the rod again. It was definitely the last one of the set, as he'd counted them all most carefully, but of the brush it then itself there was nothing to be seen. After peering hopefully up the chimney several times, Paddington sat down anxiously in the fireplace to consult the instructions on the box. As he lifted the lid, he suddenly caught sight of a large red label pasted to the bottom of the box. It had escaped his notice before, and as he read it, his eyes grew larger and larger. It said simply, Warning! 
after sweeping the chimney. Great care must be taken when unscrewing rods. Otherwise, the brush may become detached. My brush become detached? exclaimed Paddington bitterly, addressing the world in general as he gazed at the rod in one paw and the box in the other. Apart from leaving the warning about the brush becoming detached until it was far too late, the only advice the notice seemed to give for when things did go wrong was contained in the four words, Consult your nearest dealer. Paddington sat in the fireplace with a mournful expression on his face. He felt sure that Barkridge's wouldn't be at all keen if he consulted them on the br subject of Mr. Brown's brush being stuck up his chimney, and he was equally certain that Mr. Brown himself would be even less happy when he heard the news. In fact, after giving the matter a great deal of thought, the only way he could see to soften the blow at all was to clear up some of the mess and hope that while he did so, he might get an idea on the subject. If, earlier in the day, the Brown's dining room had given the impression of having been in the path of a hurricane, it now looked as if a belt of thick smog had passed through as well. Despite the dust sheet, everything seemed to be covered in a thin layer of soot, and looking round the room, Paddington decided that in more ways than one, he'd never th seen things looking quite so black. And here he is, covered in soot. Mr. Brown took his head out of the chimney and looked around at the others. "'I can't understand it,' he exclaimed. "'That's the third time I've tried to light the fire. It keeps going out!' Mrs. Broughton picked up a newspaper and began waving some of the smoke away. "'There's obviously been another fall of soot,' she said. "'It's everywhere. If you ask me, the chimney's blocked. I told you it needed sweeping.' "'How could I sweep it?' said Mr. Brown crossly. "'The kit only arrived this morning.' The Browns grouped themselves unhappily around the fireplace and stared at the pile of used matches. "'And that's another thing,' continued Mr. Brown. "'I'm sending it straight back to Barkridge's. It's filthy dirty and there isn't even a brush. You can't sweep a chimney without a brush.' "'Perhaps Paddington's borrowed it for something,' said Mrs. Brown vaguely. "'I can't find him anywhere.' "'Paddington,' echoed Mr. Brown. "'What would he want with a brush?' "'There's no knowing,' said Mrs. Bird ominously. Mrs. Bird didn't like the signs of a hurried cleaning up she'd noticed in the dining room, or the various sooty paw marks that she'd discovered during a quick glance during, around the rest of the house. But in view of the look on Mr. Brown's face, she wisely kept her thoughts to herself. "'He hasn't touched his stew,' said Mrs. Brown, "'and that's most unusual.' "'Forget Paddington's stew,' replied Mr. Brown. "'I'm more worried about the fire.' Mrs. Brown opened the French windows and looked into the garden. "'Perhaps Mr. Briggs can help,' she said. "'He's just come back.' In answer to Mrs. Brown's call, Mr. Briggs the builder came into the dining room and put his ear to the chimney with an experienced air. "'Jack Dawes,' he said after a moment. "'You've got a Jack Dawes nest in your pot. "'If you listen, you can hear him coughing.' "'Coughing?' exclaimed Mrs. Bird. "'I didn't know Jack Dawes coughed.' "'You'd cough, ma'am,' said Mr. Briggs, "'if someone tried to light a fire under your nest. "'But don't you worry,' he continued, "'opening up Mr. Brown's cleaning set. "'I'll have it out in a jiffy.' "'The Browns stood back and watched "'while Mr. Briggs began pushing the rods up the chimney. "'Good thing you had these,' he went on. "'Otherwise it might have been a rare old job.' "'Mr. Briggs's face became redder and redder "'as the rods got harder to push, "'but at long last he gave a final upward heave "'and there was a loud crashing noise "'as something heavily landed in the grate. "'There you are,' he announced triumphantly. "'What did I tell you?' "'Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses "'and peered at the round, black, bristly object "'lying on the hearth. "'It looks a sort of funny bird's nest to me,' he said. "'In fact... If you ask me, it's more like the brush out of a chimney sweeping outfit. You're quite right, said Mr. Briggs, scratching his head. It's a brush, all right. Mr. Briggs began to look even more puzzled as he picked up the object and examined it more closely. It seems to be in some sort of container, he exclaimed. That's not a container, said Mrs. Brown. It's Paddington's hat. Good heavens, so it is, exclaimed Mr. Brown. But what's it doing up the chimney, and with my brush inside it? <gasps> Mercy me, interrupted Mrs. Bird, pointing towards the window. Look! The others turned and followed the direction of her gaze. I can't see anything, said Mr. Brown. Is anything the matter? asked Mrs. Brown, looking at her housekeeper with some concern. You've gone quite white. I thought 
I saw a chimney pot go past the window, exclaimed Mrs. Bird. Mr. and Mrs. Brown exchanged glances. Normally, Mrs. Bird was the sanest member of the family, and it was most unusual for her to have hallucinations. I think you'd better sit down, said Mr. Brown, drawing up a chair. Perhaps the excitement's been too much for you. It's all right, Mrs. Bird, came a familiar, if somewhat muffled, voice from the dining room doorway. It's only me. If Mrs. Bird had been taken by surprise a moment before, the others looked even more amazed as they turned and stared at the black object before them. In place of his usual headgear, Paddington was wearing what appeared to be half a chimney pot that covered his ears and came down over his eyes like an oversized top hat. I'm afraid it broke off when Mr. Briggs poked his rods up, he explained when the noise had died down. But what on earth were you doing up on the roof in the first place? asked Mr. Brown. I was dusting the chimney, said Paddington sadly. The brush got detached by mistake and I was trying to rescue it. Paddington, echoed Mr. Briggs disbelievingly as he began levering the pot off. Proper mess he's in. Paddington looked most offended at Mr. Briggs's words as he sat on the floor rubbing his ears. It had been bad enough losing Mr. Brown's brush up the chimney in the first place, but then to get his head stuck inside the pot and be mistaken for a bird's nest into the bargain seemed the unkindest cut of all. I know one thing, said Mrs. Bird. You're going straight up to the bathroom. We must have the dirtiest bear for fifty miles. Mr. Briggs gave, Briggs gave a sudden chuckle as he looked at the others. I'll say this much, he remarked pouring oil on troubled waters. You might not have the cleanest bear within fifty miles, but I'm willing to bet there isn't a cleaner chimney. Paddington looked at Mr. Briggs gratefully, and then hurried out of the room before any more questions could be asked. For once in his life he agreed with Mrs. Bird that a nice hot bath with plenty of soap was the best order of the day. Apart from that, he had just remembered that he hadn't eaten his stew. Paddington was very keen on stew, and he was anxious to make sure the cooker was turned on so that it would be all ready for him when he got downstairs again. And here he is, taking a bath. Oh boy, there's more neighbors. So tomorrow's chapter will be Paddington in a Hole, and I haven't figured out what other book we will read, but we will be back tomorrow at 12 for another edition of Storytime Lunchtime. So I hope you have had a great day. You have enjoyed the stories. They were some of my favorites. And have a lovely rest of your day. Bye!